So maybe we'll just mix and mingle a little bit with it, because I really like what Luke had to say in chapter 2, when Mary brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger. Because we remember, don't we, that there was no room for them in the inn. And then it's interesting that there were in the same country, this is Luke chapter 2, by the way, verse 8 is where we're at now. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Boy, would you like to bed there? Taking care of the sheep. Doesn't get much more humble than that, does it? on a hillside of a night with the sheep. And John 3.16 happened. God so loved the world that he made Christmas happen. And I just think it's exciting that he came to a little rural scene. Because I grew up on a farm. I'm not going to walk up and down these steps too much this morning, but I know there's a couple here that get real nervous when I do it, and I just love that. So I'm going to do it a time or two. Paramedics, please be on standby. (laughs) It's the last of the year, and if it's going to happen, and if it's going to happen like the year's been so far, it could happen. But isn't it something that the announcement came? Glory of God. You would expect that. I mean, somebody needs to make a big deal over the first Christmas. Because the world's not going to do it. The world's not going to do it. To the world, there's still no room. No room. And God knew that. God knew that the world would turn a deaf ear and have a blind eye and wouldn't get excited about it. The world still doesn't get excited about spiritual things. World still doesn't get very excited about things that God is interested in doing. Really, they don't. They neglect Him day in and day out. But God made something happen. And and here it, it tells us, it tells us, Lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. Now that just would have been neat. To be there on a kind of humdrum night with a few bleeding sheep. And all of a sudden, an angel... I'm not sure. I have an idea 
in my mind what an angel looks like, but I don't know if I've ever really seen one. And, if, and to be truthful with you, if I would see one, don't tell anybody, but it might scare me. <laughs> but God to his people are so, is so reassuring so quickly. For when the angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And whenever the glory of the Lord comes, it tends to shine. It'll brighten the corner where you are when the glory of the Lord comes. And you know what? Because he's no respecter of persons and because for the first Christmas he came to lowly shepherds on a hillside tending to bleeding sheep, it just reminds me that wherever God finds you, wherever God first found you, Wherever he yet finds people that are on our prayer list and on our mind and, and wrapped around our heart and we care about them this, this Christmas post day, pre-New Year time. We care about them. That's why we pay the bills in the church and keep the lights on. And even when the pastor is sick, get a substitute. We care because we want people to know that there still is power, power, wonder-working power in John 3.16. In Christmas and in Calvary. Hallelujah. And so it reminds me that if he would come and appear to the shepherds on a lowly hillside, he'll go to a back alley. To find a woe begone, misused and abused girl or her boy. And in intense darkness, for the whole world was lost, the songwriter said, in the darkness of sin. Many of us know what it was like to have the lights to have gone out. And wonder if they'll ever shine for us again. But I want to tell you, and I know you know it, that as it were, the angel of the Lord still appears to a woe-begone sinner, hopeless and helpless and hapless, and the glory of the Lord can shine round about them in the sin-darkened place they be. And because of Christmas and the babe that would march triumphantly to Calvary, because of that, we can wrap up an old year regardless of what it says about you. I, uh, I tried to tell him over in the chapel this morning. I said, I didn't know what to do, so I looked. I got my inspiration, part of it, from the refrigerator. A lot of people get their inspiration from a refrigerator. I can tell by looking at them. <laughs> but I'm not talking about in it. I'm talking about on it. On it. My wife on our refrigerator has one of these. You probably can't see it well out there. And I'm not going to come all the way down there again. I'm getting tired. I asked, oops, I had it upside down. No wonder you don't recognize it. A calendar. A calendar. How many of you, this is not a trick question, how many of you have a calendar? All over the place. Those of you who don't, worry me a little. <laughs> but if it's like, if your house is like our house, my wife, she's not here this morning. 
Now, I know nobody from Lebanon will tell her I said this. Actually, she'll know before I leave. No. My wife controls our calendar. This scratching, I mean this writing, on this page, she put there. Appointments. Reminders. Recipes. Relatives. And this is only one week. There's one of these for every week. What does your calendar say about you? Oh, if I could, I wouldn't sneak into your house. I wouldn't do that. For one thing, Petey over there told me his calendar is in his refrigerator, right by the light. Which is a neat idea. I'm going to tell my wife, see if she'll go for it. But what does your calendar say about you? Because not only did Jesus come and give us Christmas, but he reminded us in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born. And a time to kick the bucket. I'm very careful what I kick. And the bucket isn't one of them. I mean, if I can help it. My luck, I'll just step on the banana peel just as I'm right beside the bucket. And on the way down, kick the bucket. Wouldn't that be a way to go? But you know what? Life is like this. And when we get to the point and the time of the year that we're at now, It can full well look like this. Written in appointments, responsibilities, reminders, little personal tidbits and mementos. Because life is like that. The living of life. I read somewhere, it was sort of interesting. I don't quote him often. Dr. Seuss. Only reason I quote him now is because the liberals have banned him. So once in a while I just pull him out of the hat. Dr. Seuss said, how did it get so late so soon? It's night before it's afternoon. December is here before it's June. My goodness, how time has flown. How did it get so late so soon? You ever hear anybody say, where is time gone? Have you ever heard anybody say, time flies? And the older you get, the faster it flies. I didn't believe that till I got as old as I am now, which is exceptionally long. I told you when I was back here in, in the meeting, and now it's worse yet. I've never, never been this old. <laughs> I can't believe it. Closed out a year like we've had 
and here I'm at Lebanon, the oldest I've ever been. I'll be so old when I get home, my wife sees me this afternoon. But anyway. <laughs> Yesterday is gone. This is profound. Tomorrow has not yet come. We only have today. Let us begin. I remember one time, just a note on time, because right here at the end of Christmas, ushering us into the new year, we're time conscious. I remember touring the Martin Guitar Factory. Have you ever done that? You have? I have too. Any of the rest of you? Nobody? One over here? Do I have another hand? <laughs> Only three or four of us have ever been to the Martin. Come on, it's a Pennsylvania thing. And I was so excited to go there because I always wanted to learn to play a Martin guitar. In fact, I wanted to learn to play any guitar. And I toured it. And at the end, remember when you go at the end, they give you a little souvenir. It's a cut out guitar hole. You know how the guitar has the hole? They, they laser cut those. And then they take those round pieces of an actual guitar, I think, and, and then they, they date them. You visited the Martin Guitar Factory, blah, blah, blah and they give them as a souvenir. And I, I like that because I figured probably mine's the one that come out of Johnny Cash's old Martin <laughs> guitar. Huh. But I remember what the guy said. He said, we are going to uh, today give you a real piece of a Martin guitar as a souvenir. And they gave it to us. And... Uh, and said, too, too bad you weren't here tomorrow, because tomorrow we're given an actual guitar to everybody that comes through. But see, tomorrow never comes. Because if you go tomorrow, it's going to be today, tomorrow, instead of yesterday, like it is today. <laughs> or something. But I never forgot that little thing because in a little way I thought that would preach. That's what we do at this time of the year. We reflect. We reflect. We reflect about things that have been written on our calendars. Events. Real events. On here, there are, this happened to be the week of Christmas, so... There's events, like a candlelight service in our little church where we attend, like perhaps some of you had. Plank family Christmas at 5 o'clock p.m. It'd be neat to have had it at 5 o'clock a.m. <laughs> More time to take things back. That's tomorrow. Tomorrow. But with Christmas, it happened. It happened on a real day. Totally unexpected, God stepped in to history. Gave us Christmas. And just as surely as he did, just as certain as he did, we've commemorated it. And someone said this morning, I believe, that even the world who doesn't believe it, yet God directs things around until they're exchanging good tidings. They're commemorating in a way, ignorantly, recognizing this is a day unlike any other. God has come. God has given us greatest gift that a man or a woman or a boy or a girl could ever receive. 
that gift is going to affect you whether you want it to or not. But if you'll gladly receive it, great will be your benefaction of, of knowing God, knowing the reality that Christmas paves the way to Calvary. And Calvary makes all the difference. Calvary makes all the difference. And it makes all the difference in the transferring of an old year. Because everything that year held, all of those events, all of those happenings, and I'd be remiss if I didn't remind us that not all of the happenings on our calendars, maybe not this week, but on some of the other sheets, not all of them were pleasant. Because if I'd go back through the sheets, some of them noted, well, some of them noted unpleasant appointments where the outcome and I guess you wouldn't say it this way, but the verdict wasn't what we wanted. But some of the notes on some of the pages were happenings that we wished hadn't. There were funerals this year. There were sad goodbyes. There were very real unpleasantries. In some of our lives this past year, things happened that we'll not, we'll not easily nor quickly get over. We won't. And that's understandable. We're human, and when our emotions have been just wrung out and stretched beyond the limit, and question marks were bigger than exclamation points, it's hard sometimes to recover. And suffering is real. Grieving is real. Hurting hurts. And all that, son, on an old year. But I told him over in chapel, you know, this was on the refrigerator. This was waiting to be on the refrigerator. This is actually, Rachel has it up on top. It's the same thing. But like one over there said, what's the difference in the two? They said the one's full and the other one's empty. The one's been filled out, and you know by now the one's been lived. And the other one hasn't. And don't we know, Lebanon, don't we know this morning that to no small degree, a new year, now I understand, you don't, a new year just by snapping your fingers or putting on the wall a brand spanking new calendar with pretty pictures of pheasants and white-tailed deer and for the guys and petunias and dandelions and stuff and lilacs for the ladies. But just simply putting a new calendar up doesn't automatically change things or people. But I don't think it's a small thing to suggest that in a real way, when God says there's a time to be born and there is a time to die, but the Bible is st stating that in other places said, Lord, teach us to number our days. James said, for what is your life? That old calendar gives a big indication of what the plank's life has been like in the last year. This one would be anybody's bet or guess 
if it were not for the reassurances that come from him. That he can order the steps, indeed, of a good man. Now, that's not a boast, because a man doesn't get good by his own thought. He gets good by the gracious grace of God. Amen. And God has taken a whole lot of bad people and made them pretty good. Just look around at your neighbor. They were real scalawags before God got a hold of them. Weren't they, Tom? Oh, yeah, I had you in mind. But we're friends, so I know I can say that. Because <laughs> he knows that I know what God's done for him. And he knows a little bit, and I do what God's done for me. We started out kind of together. <laughs> and so it's not fairy tale, and it's not fable, and it's not fancy. And now I wish upon a star or cross my fingers where I are. It's not that kind of a thing that we go into. It's not fable or fairy tale. That we lay aside an old calendar sheet and put up a new one with a clean slate. Say, let's, let's give it another shot. Lord, with your help, let's go for it. I'm not trying to be tried or light because Rachel and I have lost dear friends this past year. Last couple of years, in fact, have been some of the hardest that we've ever lived to where we've had to say goodbye to people totally unexpectedly. In just a few cases, I've participated in their funerals. And that stuff's hard. That stuff's hard because very soon, very soon, I'm going to be in a situation where I'm going to face people that are grieving, grieving terribly as they cross into a new year. And what can you say? God is able. God is able to give encouragement and to lend strength and out of ashes bring beauty. Out of weakness ordain strength. How do you know? Because from a lowly manger came a conquering Christ. And what Christmas is to us, it becomes our hope in the passage of an old year into a new. I don't know what the new year is going to hold. I've often said and believe, you know, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, and it doesn't matter who you are, if you're out in it, you're going to get wet. And, th and, and bad things happen to good people. And I'm not trying to be at all melancholy. But I'm just saying, come what may. God was with Joseph down in Egypt when he was rejected by his brethren. God was walking around in the flames with three Hebrew children when the heat was on. God showed up for Daniel <laughs> with the lions. And I'd remind you, it was in the year that King Uzziah died that Isaiah, in fact, saw the Lord. So in the midst of the furnace, in the midst of the hard place, in the midst of the difficult time, and if the new year ushers us into some storms and tests and trials and temptations and troubles, if it does, a songwriter said, if Jesus goes with me, I can go anywhere, anywhere. But I would like to just remind you that the God who knows everything written on the used up sheet is willing to assist us in making the writing of the new one. 
And because of Christmas, he can genuinely, spiritually help us, teach us to number our days. And realize that in him there is joy unspeakable and full of glory and peace that passeth all understanding. And that even when tragedy comes, if you're ready to go to be with the Lord, it's but goodbye here and hello there. And one of these days, one of these days, I think, I think I've lived more now than I'm going to yet live. Because, you know, at my age, I've got to become very exceptionally careful. <laughs> There's no buckets in here, Tom. <laughs> I looked. <laughs> and no bananas either, unless you got one in your pocket. Which I wouldn't put it past you. No, I don't mean to be light or trifling about your hurtings. But I want to tell you there's a God in heaven that can come and step right beside you. And when he steps up beside you, it makes all the difference in the world. And when he puts his arm around you, it instills strength in you that you will be able to stand when you don't think you can. And in your deepest grief and darkest sorrow and direst temptation, there's a God in heaven that says that, that he ordains his strength out of our weakness. And like we've come to know, little is much if God is in it. Praise the Lord. Well, i got to let you go. I gotta let you go. We certainly hope, don't we? Don't we hope that Alan Walter gets his voice back? Oh. Anyway, what an honor to be able to come and fill in for him today when he asked. I happened to have it open, so I said, yeah, I'll come down, because I owed him one. Did I tell you when I was here, when I got to go to Cuba with Brother Walter? Alan Walter and I walked around in Havana, Cuba. And over there, I've always been indebted to him because of his upbringing. His upbringing. He reminded me of it, comparing it to mine. But I, I took no offense. We had had meager fare as far as, you know, steak and potatoes and any kind of meat, not, not just steak. We had one little chicken that blessed their heart. Our Cuban missionaries gave us and I couldn't, I could hardly eat it. I like chicken, but you know, they'd caught this little chicken. It was a little chicken. And they tied a string around its neck or its foot, I can't remember, leg. And they tied it to the table leg in the dining room. About three days before we were gonna eat it. And it looked at me so pitifully. Kind of like some of you. <laughs> and they wouldn't feed it because we're going to eat it. So I slept, you know, being of tender heart, and a Christian, I'd slip at little morsels of my stuff, partly because I didn't like the stuff anyway. <laughs> I mean, they, I, don't, I hope they're not listening yet because they, they were gracious. But anyway, Alan Walter was along. And we finally got into, I'm going to let you go after this because it's past time. You're going to miss the bus. We got into Havana, Cuba, and we thought one meal we're going to splurge in a big restaurant in Havana, Cuba. And so we did. We went in this restaurant. Fancy place. I mean, fancy place. Alan felt right at home because of his upbringing, but I'm a farm boy. I didn't. I hope he's not listening. <laughs> anyway, of course, everything's Espanol. No comprehendo. No read <laughs> No read a menu. 
I depended on my brothers, and here after we get in there, we find out it's, of all things, a vegetarian. <laughs> Our choice of all the good restaurants in Havana, Cuba, and we pick one that eats turnips and carrots. <laughs> and the stuff they give us, they give you big portions, but oh, whatever I had on mine, something, bamboo or something. I chewed on it and chewed on it and chewed on it, and I'm telling you, Leonard, the more you chewed, the more you had in your mouth. <laughs> I don't know if I ever going to get done eating. And Alan, look, I don't mean to be dis... I'm not being disrespectful to refer to him to Alan. He's, he's younger than me, but we're up there. And he lost his voice, and I didn't. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, he looked over at me, and he said, don't you like it? I said... No. I mean, it's a time when you've got to be honest. I don't like it. I was thinking we're going to go out and eat a good meal. And I'm chewing on fibrous bamboo shoots. He said, well, I was taught. Here's, I've, this still rings in my ear because he said it in English. He said, I was taught to eat what's set before me. You did it. But, being of super intelligence, I took my big plate and put it over in front of him. <laughs> I thought, once in a while, you're forced to fast. <laughs> and he ate it, too. He ate it all. Everything. So it's an honor for me to be able to repay him by filling in for him this morning. <laughs> now, Alan, we're even. Anyway, Merry Christmas past, Happy New Year coming. Put your new calendar up. Let it in 2022 say the right things about you. Because there's a time for everything under the sun. Stand. Shake hands with your neighbor. And follow your intuition. <laughs>